Uh, our very first presenter is the one and only Jamie Ian Swiss. Uh, he's a magician, he's an author, he's a public speaker, he's the founder of the New York City Skeptics, uh, he's the VP of the San Diego Skeptic Society, you've seen him on countless television shows, uh, uh, just one of the, one of the preeminent uh, guys in this field. Uh, his talk is called Credit the Con Man. Please welcome Jamie Ian Swiss. Thank you, George. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Well, we're going to start with a little bit of a demonstration, and I ask the gentleman right here, could you come up and scamper up on stage and give him a warm welcome to help me out, because it's, he's in for a thankless task. Come closer, and I get a psychic vibration. Your name is Armel. Um, it's a gift. Uh, okay, so here's a little game they've been playing for 150 years. Nobody's won yet, but this could be your lucky day. Uh, so this is a little game that started in the mid-19th century where uh, in posh surroundings, much like these, um, luxury uh, tra uh, train cars and Mississippi river boats and things like that, hustlers, con men came to fleece the wealthy. Uh, and they played a little game with, uh, and you're going to want to be on here for the rest of your life. Okay. Uh, they played a little game called uh, Three Card Monty. They played it with uh, a red card, another red card, and a black card. They bent the cards a little bit to facilitate handling them off a hard surface. And the idea, you ready? The idea was to keep your eyes on the black card. Red card, black card, red card. Now, uh, this is 150 years ago. It's a simpler time. You probably found an easy matter to find the Follow the black card over here, right? Okay, it's all right. So, now the thing is, by the turn of the century, by the turn of the 20th century, the game fell away, vanished to, uh, to sort of, you know, dusty back rolled carnivals and the like. That was about it. Until 1973, when the game came back with a rush to uh, what at least one expert has called the Monte capital of the world, my hometown, New York City. And when the game came back, they'd made a couple of changes over the many years. First of all, gone with the posh surroundings. Now they played it on street corners on a stack of cardboard boxes. Uh, they also uh, now played the game with a, uh, a red card and uh, a black card and uh, another black card. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you're paying attention. So, uh, <laughs> and the game was often accompanied now by a line of running patois so known in the region. Uh, ready? Here's a game if you want to make money. Five, it gets you 10, 10, it gets you 20. 20 gets you 40, 40 gets you 80. 80 gets you my old lady, but she's too fat. Red card moves like a snake in the grass, sometimes slow and sometimes fast. Did you see the red card fall here? <laughs> no? You, no? Where, where, do you, where do you think of it? No, you gotta trust me, I'm trying to explain to you how it works. <laughs> okay. All right. now, now, a lot of people know, a lot of people sort of intuitively know, they've heard that the three card money is a scam, but they don't know how the scam works, right? And so they often think, I've often heard it theorized, that once the, uh, the, the uh, operator starts to toss the cards, that the red card, the money card, is no longer on the table, okay? And, uh, and I understand this because it's true. See, this card's black, and this card's black, and this card's black. Uh, all, the, all, these, uh, all these cards are actually black, except, except for uh, uh, that one. So, but the truth is, is that the red card is always there. That is a myth that the red card is somehow palmed or pocketed or something. That's, not, that's a myth. It's only three cards, the red card, the money card is always on the table. Now, um, I've seen all kinds of things uh, when it comes to this game. See, you know, they say it's a game of chance. It's actually a game of no chance, right? You know, it's, it's, it's only a one in three chance if you close your eyes. That's, that's true, I'm not lying. If you open your eyes, you have no chance at all. Uh, and uh, I've even seen something as extreme as this. Back in the heyday, you don't see Monty as commonly today in New York City, but back in the, back in the 70s and the early 80s, uh, it was all over. And uh, it, Times Square, tourist areas, but also downtown Wall Street, fleecing those guys, which may be the rough justice. But um, so, uh, 
But I've even seen something like this. Now, this is for demonstration, this is an extreme example, but I've actually seen the outcome, the thing I'm going to show you at the end here of this, of this segment. So let's say that there's, that's the red card, and I'm not even going to touch it now, okay, just for demonstration purposes. You might call this moron Monty, all right? And let's say just by chance, by accident, that the player accidentally picks the right card. Well, I've seen the operator go, no, 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 it's not over here, it's over here. And, you know, who are you going to complain to, customer service? <laughs> so, uh, all right. So now, if I wish I had a buck for every person who ever said to me, oh, yeah, I won the three-card Monty once. Liar! Uh, I don't think anyone who's ever told me that was telling me the truth unless they were a professional hustler. Uh, the three-card Monty is actually an elaborate theatrical production. It is not the sleight-of-hand maneuver. There is a sleight-of-hand maneuver, but it's not the sleight-of-hand maneuver that makes it work, and I'm going to talk more about that later. It's actually all the roles, the characters on the street. So there's the operator, but there's also typically at least two shills, confederates. If you see someone win at three-card Monty, they are playing with the operator's money. I promise you, 100% of the time, not 99, 100% of the time. And they're there to strategically sometimes win to show that the guy pays, or sometimes lose to show the mark, that's you, uh, that you're smarter than the operator. That's the idea. That's confidence, right? It's to gain your confidence. So uh, I don't recommend that you ever play this game. Uh, the old timers would occasionally pay off because they knew they felt that if you got lucky and they paid you, you would just bet it right back because now you had the false confidence that you'd figured it out. But these days, they play in Monty mobs. Could be three games on a block, maybe two Monty games, and a shell game played with soda caps these days instead of, instead of walnut shells. And uh, then there's a, a bunch of uh, confederates that look different, that dress different than the operator, right? There, there might be, he, if he looks like a street guy, then the Confederates might be really well-dressed. She's wearing a fur and he's wearing a business suit. Or the other way around, he could be wearing a nice suit and they could look like street folk. Uh, so there's Confederates, there's also the wall man, which is a lookout, a security guy. So there could be a dozen people on the block and they just as soon knock you over the head and grab your wallet once that money is out, then pay you. So you, you really you don't, take, you don't risk your money today, you actually kind of risk your, your safety and your life. So I don't recommend this at all. But I did once actually take a money operator for a couple of dollars just so that I could come here and tell you about it today. So here's the way it went down in the summer of 1973 on the corner of West 3rd Street and 6th Avenue in New York's Greenwich Village. It's a simple little game where the cards go round. All you got to see is where the red goes down. Put your green on the red and then I'll see if your five going to make you ten. He showed me where it is, he said. He's, I, I, no, let me do it this way, actually. Different sequence. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One more time. Uh, there it is. Do it around again. If you didn't think you didn't see it then, sh stick around. I'll show it around again. I'll show it around again. I'll show you where it is, he said. I'll show you where it's not. Place your bet. See what you got. When I cross my hands, I might have fooled some man. Now, just then, the Confederate this r runs in, and he throws $20 on this card here and loses, right? And so now I go to throw a 20 and the guy says, no, 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 it's 50-50 it's, it's, it's now. It's, you already saw one of the cards. I only take a $50 bet. I took out the 50 bucks, and I made it look like I was going to go to the card where he wanted me to go, right? Which was there. But I knew that the Monty operator had the red card over here. Are you stunned or stoned? I can't tell the difference. <laughs> Now, I've seen this, place, this game played all around the world. In uh, London, they put a big umbrella on the ground. They open a big umbrella on the ground, and they use the top of the umbrella sort of as a surface, right? Uh, I've seen it uh, played um, by Russian immigrants, a, a version of the shell game, but they use big plastic cups with big red sponge balls. Amazing thing. Uh, I was walking down the street with Pendulette, as a matter of fact, the day I saw that. Um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen it in, uh, in Paris where they often use a queen uh, as the money card. They call it Cherche la Femme, another game I've played and lost. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that no matter, for whatever the reason, the tradition, uh, wherever you see it played, the black card is always a loser. Black cards lose. Black cards lose and red cards win. Okay, so now, of course, it's a money game. We're not going to play for money. It's just gentlemen's bet, all right? But just so you have the experience of taking a shot at it, okay? I'm just going to mix the cards around like this and uh, just, just take a guess. Where do, you th where do you think it might be? In the middle. In the middle. 
Oh, great, you got any money? <laughs> no? All right. Well, we'll mix it around again. There it is. There's, there's the red card. And uh, where am I? Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, pick it again. Ah, yeah, because I flashed one accidentally. Now, some of you might have been watching this bent card here. Some of you see that? That's what you used the first time, right? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Well, see, some people could use that to cheat because the money card's over there. All right, and that's three card money. The only way to win is not to play. Thank you so much. Thanks to RML for helping me out. All righty, thank you very much. We're done. So uh, that's a brief and I hope entertaining demonstration of the old street con called the three card money. Why do people still get taken by this ancient swindle. H.L. Mencken said that for every complex problem, there's a solution that is neat, plausible, and wrong. And so one simple answer to the question is that there's a secret sleight of hand maneuver, like I mentioned, a switch that the operator is using in order to deceive the player. Well, that's a fact, that's true, but it's not really the answer to the question. Another possible answer is that people are stupid. There's a sucker born every minute, a phrase often but mistakenly attributed to P.T. Barnum. He didn't say it. Uh, if my ex, but the, but the, but the, but the phrase that, ha that hustlers use that goes with that, that many, most of you have never heard, there's a sucker more in every minute and two to take them. Now, if my expertise in deception has taught me anything, it's this, that anyone can be fooled, uh, even an expert in deception. All too often we blame the victims of a street side short con or a grand Ponzi scheme, but in the relationship of predator to prey, do we give the tiger credit for his powerful muscles, his claws, his fangs, his stealthy approach, or do we simply fault the antelope for being too slow and stupid? If the default position is to, claim, is to blame the victim, then we give no credit to the victimizer and we fail to credit the con man. That's what I'm here to talk about today. So I want to share some of the real reasons almost everyone can be conned and demonstrate why these answers should be of value and importance to skeptics in particular, to rational and critical thinkers of every stripe, and to those interested in trying to understand how and why people can so often be manipulated into embracing false beliefs, paranormal beliefs, and thereby fall victim to dangerous and sometimes devastating scams. Now in the case of the Monty, one answer is that over those 150 years of tossing, Professional con artists have finally honed these skills. And it's hard to imagine without actually seeing it, as I've witnessed it countless times, the breathtaking speed and ruthless efficiency of the psychological warfare waged by the Monty mob. The Three Card Monty is in reality an elaborate theatrical production, as I mentioned, with multiple actors, each playing a key role in hooking the player, not just intellectually, which would reduce the game to a little more than really ignore the puzzle, but emotionally which turns that little puzzle into a personal <clears throat> drama. The Monty operator is not an expert in sleight of hand. He may be good at what he does, but he hasn't a fraction of the skills possessed by even your amateur magician friend who's got a new card trick to try it out to show you every now and then at lunch. But like the professional magician, the Monty operator is an expert in deception and psychological manipulation. His game is not just a game of wits, but rather a game of ego. It's not just a gamble on three cards, but rather it's his bet that he can gain the victim's confidence, the origin of con and confidence, and lead him to put his money down on what seems like to him like a sure thing. Now, as it happens, I'm a specialist in deception. My skills of deception, psychological, physical, mechanical, are most visibly applied to the creation of entertaining and artistic illusions for the pleasure of my audience. But I'm also deeply interested in far less benign uh, uses of deception from con games to cheating and gambling to fraudulent psychic claims and more. My expertise is narrow but deep. I know how to fool people and I know how to recognize when people are being fooled. So I'm going to take on a brief tour of some of those interests of mine now <clears throat> and the lessons I think they hold for skeptics. Now I've done some work in the field of casino security and I also present demonstrations and performances of the skills of the card cheats and casino hustlers. I've probably spent more time up in the eye in the sky looking down than I have sitting at green felt tables. They have no sense of humor about guys like me. <laughs> um, but now the fact is that among these kinds of gaming cheats, often boldness is the greatest asset that the professional hustler possesses. Like most criminals, he doesn't think he's going to get caught, so he's willing to hazard 
Tremendous risk. Risk it would seem lunatic to most of us. I've had the chance to view countless hours of eye in the sky footage, casino footage, it's all recorded. And I can tell you that significant sleight of hand technical skill like we see in the movies, it does exist. I've occasionally seen it, but it is a rarity. Most card cheats are just fearless, ham-fisted clowns. They just they have as much skill as the average bank robber. It's just their, you know, their weapon is three cards instead of a gun. But the professional cheat, who's much more readily found, by the way, in social games rather than in casino games, must, like the street scam grifter, also gain the confidence of his victims. The guy who comes to your weekly poker game who never wins really big but always seems to win steadily, sometimes almost accidentally, just luck, and rarely loses, might also be the friendly, helpful guy who took your wife to the dentist when the car was in the shop, you know, came by to feed the cats. He could be the perfect guy to be cheating just enough at your weekly game, and maybe half a dozen other weekly games that you don't know about, to be quietly making a very comfortable living uh, at your expense with the help of a few select card cheating moves. And at a casino, it's often the seemingly slow player, the guy who doesn't quite understand the rules of the game, or an apparently drunk player who's getting the dealer's attention while the mechanic is pulling a card or a dice switch at the other end of the table. This, that's real, that's real. Again, the psychology, though, is the real secret, and some of the oldest advice still stands. Never play cards with strangers. And then there's this old saying I mentioned the other night, trust everybody, but always cut the cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anybody have a particular interest in those subjects, like cheating at cards, cheating at gambling, casino cheating, whatever, I might, if you catch me at lunch or something, I'm happy to talk more specifically about that, but this is just an overview. Another subject, 88 years after Charles Ponzi created the financial scam that bears his name today and for which he went to prison twice, Bernard Madoff, better known as Bernie, was arrested on December 11, 2008 for operating the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, having built his victims out of an estimated $65 billion, with a B, dollars, enough to fund the American war in Afghanistan on full tilt for a full year. Since pleading guilty in 2009, Madoff is currently serving a 150 year sentence, the maximum allowable term for his crimes, an example set by the judge. Although almost a decade later, some elements continue to remain unknown or not fully or publicly explained about the details of Madoff's crime, we now believe Madoff was engaged in his systematic thievery since 1991. He was arrested in 2008. So how could Bernie Madoff have operated successfully for so long and still have been bringing in new investors, that is, victims, literally within days of his self-planned arrest, within days? Recall that the sleight of hand maneuver that switches two cards in the Monty game is a useless device without the psychology and the theater of it, without the emotional confidence the operator instills in his mark. Well, the same was true for Madoff, whose victims number in the thousands, from elderly widows to massive banking institutions, the phony monthly statements that Madoff sent out, concocted and printed on dot matrix printers, yeah, the master of technology he was, was part of the trick, all part of the trick of Madoff's scam, but, it's not what made the scam work any more than the Monty Man sleight of hand card trick. Bernie Madoff's greed and pathology would have gotten him nowhere without the psychology of what's known as an affinity scheme, a deadly game that built trust based on tribalism, creating desire based on the perception of exclusivity, built confidence with those, those uh, primitive monthly statements, mailed the widows and financial titans alike that detailed the stocks and securities that they owned when in fact they owned nothing of the sort. Madoff actively solicited business on an ongoing and aggressive basis, making his investment fund seem all the more attractive, not only by way of its apparent safety and steady semi-conservative profitability, <clears throat> but also because of the carefully manufactured and maintained illusion of exclusivity. By turning away the occasional investor with apparent arrogance and disregard, I don't need your money, he was famously known to declare, you know, at the golf, at the golf club uh, bar on the 19th hole, particularly, though, to prospects with too many questions. 
Madoff actually helped to build his myth that way, but at the same time he was protecting himself by people who were too inquisitive, and by so doing built the desirability of his fun. Madoff's a criminal, a con man, a predator, a sociopath, and an expert deceiver who worked hard to maintain his deceptions. And I can't think of the name of it offhand, but there's a podcast, a reporter who worked for years trying to get to talk to Madoff in prison, and eventually did, and did like a six-part podcast uh, about the Madoff scan, and it's fascinating to listen to Madoff's voice and also to learn some of the complexities of it because in a way Madoff was also a victim of uh, financial op other financial operators uh, <clears throat> that he was in sway to. Anyway, my point is this, that when dealing with professionals, be it a magician, a money man, or a Madoff, it's a mistake to blame the victim. That's what I'm here to talk to you about. Whether it's a card trick, a con game, or a billion dollar Ponzi scheme. To blame the victim offers no useful insight and teaches us little about what's actually occurred and nothing about how to protect ourselves or to protect others. But in the immediate aftermath of the Madoff affair, there was no shortage of voices ready to blame the victims of Madoff's predations. New York Times Columnist Joe Nocera addressed the Madoff case for the first time in March 13, 2009, almost three months to the day after Madoff's arrest, with a piece that was topped with this headline, quote, Madoff had accomplices, his victims. Six long weeks later, on June 29th, Nocera's headline was, Madoff victims get over it. What a douche. Eventually, though, even though Sarah became sympathetic to the victims as the tragedies of their individual stories began to become public and, more, and horrifying. So there's two key lessons to draw from the Madoff disaster, apart from the failed responsibilities of the SEC and other regulators. Lesson one is this, anyone can be fooled. And the moment you think you can't, you're lining up to be somebody's next victim. Lesson two is that before you blame the victim, we must first and always credit the con man. So let's talk about something closer to home for skeptics, namely psychics and psychic fraud. In August of 2011, notorious Florida psychic Rosa Marks and eight other members of her Romany family, common term gypsy, Romany more uh, proper term, were arrested on a 28 count indictment, including charges of money laundering, mail and wire fraud, uh, a quote from an article in the Broward Palm Beach New Times, which actually does a good job of covering these stories. Quote, authorities allege the Klan used its spiritual hold to squeeze $40 million from clients. That was from the initial story. Later, that was reduced to $25 million in the indictments, and eventually what went to court was $17 million, um, which is what they had the strongest evidence for to convict on. doesn't mean the $40 million wasn't an accurate number. The $25 certainly was an accurate number. Uh, the state's key witness, Jude Devereaux, author of bestsellers, she's a, a, just a world-class romance novel author, uh, Scarlet Nights, Days of Gold, I, I fear I have not read these myself, uh, and 35 other books that together have sold more than 60 million copies worldwide, first fell in with the family in 1991 after walking into a Mark's own shop in Manhattan because these Romany groups are particularly, they're interconnected between New York City all those, all those storefront psychic shops that you pass, and South Florida. It's all the same people, uh, same network. Over 20 years, Marx leveraged Devereaux's marital problems, pregnancy fears, and grief over the death of a child. Large sums of money and valuables passed between the author and the psychic, all to be used in rituals to clear out curses, and Devereaux personally may have lost as much as $17 million. And in 2013, Marx was finally convicted on all 14 counts of the eventual trial indictment and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. But she is the exception. It's rare for people to go public with their complaints. It's rarer still for police to pursue such cases to the point of making arrests. It's rare for prosecutors to take such crimes to trial, preferring far more often to make plea deals and try to get some partial financial restitution for the victims. It's, better for the, it's kinder for the victims, but it leaves the predators out there. And in this case, it was Marx who stubbornly insisted she was a victim of a zealous prosecution, and thus she repeatedly refused to take plea deals, forced the trial, which ended up essentially doubling what would have been her eventual sentence. <clears throat> Good girl. <laughs> and that same article I mentioned, <laughs> are, you, are, you, are, you, are you enjoying them longer or getting them later? 
Uh, in that same article I mentioned, which was titled How Modern Fortune Tellers Pull Off Their Scams, a reporter, Kyle Swenson, recounts, de you can find this story online, detailed and horrifying stories of four devastated victims of fortune-telling scam artists. Okay, lest you think that you're so different from these people or these are people are so different from you. The victims, all women, included a 27-year-old woman of Indian descent who grew up in England, a married 42-year-old uh, Indian woman with a master's in applied economics, not the stereotype of a psychic victim, a divorcee in her early 60s, and a young 19-year-old woman. All were experiencing personal struggles in their lives and were emotionally vulnerable when they exposed themselves to heartless predators ready to take advantage of such wounded prey. Again, the emotional component is a necessity to explain and understand how otherwise rational people can suddenly and unexpectedly become entrapped by professional uh, con artists who possess an arsenal of finely honed skills of psychological manipulation. In the case of the 27-year-old woman, in swift succession, this is a quote from the story, she lost her job and her four-year marriage snapped. Then in the course of three years after meeting the psychic, quote again, she, remo she remortgaged her house, took out loans, borrowed from the family. She ended up handling, handing over $140,000 over three years before completely running out of resources. And the other victims recount similar tales. And these stories may seem incredible to you, but they are far from uncommon. It's the exception that we find out about. Storefront psychics look at every new, every new client who walks in for that $5 reading right, as a potential golden goose to bleed dry over the long, brutally patient haul. They'll always give you a really good reading, except there's this one thing they want to help you with. And the only rare aspects of these stories are that these victims went public and the cases were prosecuted. Victims are usually too humiliated to admit such losses. They have difficulty understanding themselves how it happened, much less explaining it to others. So, you know, how did they get in so deep and for so long? And often it happens to the elderly and they don't want to admit to their families. Along with the skills of these victimizers, the psychological mechanism, however, known as cognitive dissonance, also provides an important part of the answer and explanation to all this. Once people make a commitment of belief in money, they will justify that commitment as being wise and sensible, making it increasingly difficult to face the possibility of having actually made a terrible mistake. And this is why people end up hand handing over even more money in the hope and faith their investment will pay off in the form of relief from the struggles and pains that sent them seeking help in the right in the first place. It's a vicious cycle that a cold-blooded con artist knows, knows about and knows exactly how to skillfully maintain and feed off of it. As the well-known social scientist, author and skeptic Carol Tavers writes in her wonderful book, Mistakes Were Made by not, but, not like, but Not By Me, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, quote, the ability to reduce dissonance helps us in countless ways, preserving our beliefs, confidence, decisions, self-esteem, and well-being, but this ability can also get us into big trouble. People will pursue self-destructive courses of action to protect the wisdom of their initial decision. So, close quote, so as we try to unpack the mystery of how someone hands over their personal fortune to a phony psychic, we first have to credit the con man. But then we have to look at the con man's tools, which in turn are skills of manipulating the workings of human psychology. And that leads you to an important psychological mechanism like cognitive dissonance, which is a remarkable phenomenon that, thanks to its own workings, few of us really want to admit how much it can influence our own behavior. Now, Michael Shermer, in his excellent book, Why People Believe Weird Things, writes, quote, in my opinion, most believers in miracles, monsters, and mysteries are not hoaxers, flim-flam artists, or lunatics. Most are normal people whose normal thinking has gone wrong in some way. Exactly. So how does that happen? Well, how and why can our thinking go so suddenly, so readily wrong, and often so far wrong at that? Well, one potent element besides cognitive dissonance is magical thinking. We humans have evolved as pattern-seeking animals, possessing a unique cognitive ability that enables us to draw connections, to learn from experience, to identify causes and effect. We make judgments every day that, in the larger scheme of things, serve us well, particularly when we were social hunter-gatherers on the grasslands of Africa. Sherman writes that, quote, humans evolved the ability to seek and find connections between things and events in the environment, snakes with rattles should be avoided, and those who made the most connections left behind the most offspring. We are their descendants. The problem is, causal thinking is not infallible. 
We make connections whether they're there or not. Close quote. Magicians thrive on this evolutionarily programmed tendency. Shermer goes on to dub our central processor, the pattern-seeking brain, as the belief engine, and he theorizes that, quote, under certain conditions it leads to magical thinking, under different circumstances it leads to scientific thinking. And he adds that natural selection has resulted in the fact that, quote, the belief engine is a useful mechanism for survival, not just for learning about dangerous and potentially lethal environments, but in reducing anxiety about that environment through magical thinking. So he's pointing out that, again quoting, there is psychological evidence that magical thinking reduces anxiety in certain environments. We think magically because we have to think causally. We have magical thinking and superstitions because we need critical thinking and pattern finding. They're inescapably, uh, they cannot be separated. Magical thinking is a necessary byproduct of the evolved mechanism of causal thinking. Still quoting here, believers in UFOs, alien abductions, ESP, psychic phenomena, their thinking has gone wrong. But he adds, optimistically and accurately, that fortunately there is an abundance of evidence that the belief engine is malleable. Critical thinking can be taught. Skepticism is learnable. So indeed, it has to be learnable because it's certainly not a natural way to, for humans to think. In an excellent provocative book published in 1995, Uncommon Sense, The Heretical Nature of Science by Alan Cromer, the author explains that far from being natural, scientific thinking goes so far against the grain of conventional human thought that if it hadn't been discovered by, the, by well, briefly in Greece, it might have never been discovered at all. Cromer presents the argument that science represents a radically new and different way of thinking, a way that is completely unnatural to the biologically evolved species known as Homo sapiens. The entire duration of our species' existence on the Earth is little more than a blink in evolutionary time, after all, right? When you consider the fact that dinosaurs were here for 350 million years, and even if you include early hominids like Australopithecines, what, what have we been here, six million, seven million years, and then it's not until the Greeks just 2,000 years ago that the scientific method is conceived, and then the era of modern scientific thought and method goes back only to maybe as far as Galileo, some 400 years. It's not even a blink in evolutionary time. It's barely measurable. And yet it contains most of our significant accomplishments as humans, from discovering the origins of the universe to the germ theory of disease to landing men on the moon. As a species, we've only just begun to learn to think scientifically. As individuals, we each have to learn how. We each have to be taught how. We won't just come into it on our own. And left to our own devices, we're still just magical thinkers trying to survive in the African plains. We could be dancing for rain for another thousand years just because a long drought once ended after an evening's dance party. <laughs> now, there's a conventional trope about people supposedly wanting to be deceived. I hear this all the time. I think it's nonsense. Rather, there are aspects of the way our brains evolve that can, as a side effect, lead us to be deceived safely by magicians, dangerously by advertisers and politicians, all but fatally by con men and sociopaths. And there's one more important facet in this mix, and that is the role played by trust. Human beings have evolved to be trusting beings. It makes sense to want to believe people. We've evolved to disbelieve that people are capable of lying directly to our faces. Because the alternative, an ever vigilant extreme of caution and protectiveness, well, that's contrary to being an effective social animal. A human animal that's constantly wary, relentlessly on guard, quick to protect itself against any risk of deception, would be very untrusting being. And that's not a being that will find it easy to develop constructive relationships and function well socially with his peers, colleagues, family, and society, even to organize and engage in group hunting of giant mammals in the Pleistocene. To do the, all of these things, we must be willing to trust others despite the associated risks. And one important evolutionary protection we have against deceivers is our built-in in-group, out-group programming, which kicks in at a very early age in higher mammals, just after we've learned to recognize immediate friends and family. But it's a sloppy and imprecise sort of generalized hope for the best evolved protection. It doesn't account for individuals who are willing to operate maliciously from within the group. It doesn't protect you from the likes of Bernie Madoff, 
who ruthlessly relied upon in-group status to manipulate his victims. And as Carol Tavers pointed out to me, cognitive dissonance is pre-wired to protect us from the times when we will inevitably be fooled, which typically produces dissonance. How could I have been so stupid? And which we immediately strive to reduce. I wasn't stupid, let me mortgage my house and give the guy another hundred grand, I'll show you how smart I was. That's how it works. People actually did that with Madoff. So the victim's cognitive dissonance helps the con man in his ongoing predation, <coughs> while his own dissonance helps him think, hey, he's not such a bad guy while he's doing it. It's not like he held a gun up to him. I've heard that sentence from con artists. So I confess it's foolish to talk about people's desire to be deceived. Just as any of us can be fooled, all of us can engage in self-deception as well. I mean, we do. That can, we do. Ultimately, it's for a higher purpose, for the, if you will, for the benefits it delivers us in dealing with ourselves and with other people and the inherent dissonance of this world and this life. Nobody wants to be fooled, except maybe at the magic show. But fooled we all shall be, and it cannot happen without trust. So the ability to trust, even when the cost means being occasionally victimized, is central and essential in human life and society. So sure, try not to get fooled, but don't be too hard on yourself when it happens. Now my real message today is about what skeptics need to know. Scientific skepticism is about educating and informing the public about promoting science and critical thinking and advocating the scientific worldview and also about debunking for purposes of educating and also to confront fraud and serve as consumer advocates and protectors. That's our self-assigned tasks. These are the core purposes, if you will, of scientific skepticism. But before we can educate others, we must also educate ourselves. And every skeptic who thinks that the explanation of a successful psychic scam or crackpot alternative medicine pitch is just to declare another sucker getting what he deserves for his stupidity is wrong. That doesn't just reveal a lack of empathy. More significantly, it reveals a lack of expertise. It's easy to understand that transcendental meditation will never teach people to float because we understand physics and biology, but it's not so easy to understand why people give up their lives to a dangerous cult and think that bouncing on their buttocks is a, transi is a transitional step to human flight. But I've seen it. Randy and I saw that together years ago in Washington, D.C., along with uh, Chip Denman. If you want to talk to people about not getting conned, then it's your responsibility to inform yourself about how and why people do get conned. The literature is out there. It's excellent. It makes for great and provocative reading. I just recently reread Michael Shermer's Why We Believe Weird Things, and it's basic text for skeptics. Uh, it's a basic text for living life as a human being and trying to navigate the hazards of the world. And if you haven't read Carol Tavis's uh, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, you haven't read up on this phenomenon of how cognitive dissonance works, you'll never understand why people insist on tossing good money after bad whether it's to a storefront psychic or a street side scam artist or the Bernie Madoffs of the world. Now, I admit it's not always cut and dried. Who's the victim and who's the victimizer? It's important to recognize and acknowledge there's a difference between a tobacco company and a smoker. Tobacco companies willfully concealed and distorted scientific information in order to promote their profit and poison. They deserve to be called out, challenged, prosecuted in every conceivable manner. So to me, before you focus your laser sight and point your finger as a verbal trigger, I simple, simply ask that you pause and ask yourself, am I talking to a smoker or to a tobacco company? To a victim or a victimizer? James McCormick, does that name ring a bell? Whose company, ATSC, manufactured phony bomb detection technology, right? The, the dowsing for bombs. Warranted prosecution and a 10-year prison sentence in England. James Von Prague, John, John Edward, the late Sylvia Brown, and their ilk deserve our scorn and our confrontations. The manufacturers of homeopathic remedies warrant our debunkings and demonstrations. But those who fall prey to these skilled and powerful and well-financed predators deserve not just the facts as we know them, but also our empathy. It does no one any good to label those victims of psychic fraud as merely stupid or gullible. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help protect their, their, uh, their next potential victim. It isn't that our true goal as skeptics. What well, was a vet was saying the other day about, you know, is it, is it gullibility or is it vulnerability? Great question. Great way of putting the distinction. Now, is there a clear dividing line? Okay, there isn't. 
As skeptics, we confront issues that are complex and as messy as the entire spectrum of human behavior itself. When a homeopathy user becomes a debater or a promoter of the useless product he wastes his money on, what's the best response? I don't pretend to always know. But for us as skeptics, the simple fact we're right, or even that the science is on our side, is not enough to change anybody's mind, much less to change the world. Speaking purely for myself, I don't generally debate these issues with individual consumers or believers. I'll state the science briefly and simply, offer an informative reference or useful book title, and then move on. What's the point of an argument? I know how cognitive dissonance works. <coughs> Uh, and I don't have a magic set of wire cutters that's going to let me disarm that circuit board in our heads. I'm fighting millions of years of evolution. Does all this sound messy, unclear? Wait, it gets worse. What if I told you that even John Edward and James Von Prague who talk to the dead psychics might actually believe they have some psychic ability? Or more significantly, believe that no matter what technique or methods they might be, even if they're a little dis deliberately deceptive, nonetheless they think they're actually helping people. The fact of the matter is, no villain ever looked in the mirror and declares, mirror, mirror, on the wall, who is the most villainous villain of all? Tis I! Tis I! Tis I! <laughs> Nobody does that shit, only in the movies. <laughs> the truth is far more complicated than that because the scene, well, the reason it's in the movies at all is because it simplifies the story for us. It simplifies our world. It gives us the hope we can be safe from monsters because they're obvious and brilliant and they're evil. As scary as Hannibal Lecter is, it's a fun kind of scary because he's a comforting fiction. The terrifying reality lies in the banality of evil as brought to life in pathetic losers like Son of Sam Killer David Berkowitz and David Mark Chapman who murdered John Lennon. That's the reality. But the messy part of this means that while we can speculate on the mindset, we can speculate on the mindset of professional grief, grief vampires like Talk to the Dead Medium John Edward or Spoonbender now turned motivational speaker Yuri Geller, we cannot know for certain what is in their mind and hearts. We cannot know for certain. We can speculate. We cannot know. And so we must first make our moral decisions by judging their behavior, not their imagined or theorized intentions. I believe that professional mediums hurt people, prey on their victims' vulnerabilities, worsen their lives, and if the selective feedback they get from their supporters along with the psychological workings of cognitive dissonance mean they believe their own bullshit, I don't care. I don't care if tobacco executives or homeopathic remedy dealers believe their own bad thinking and bad science. They all deserve to be called out for making the world a worse place and damaging people's lives. But what does that tell us? about how to talk to the intermediary, the guy who sells homeopathic remedies and thinks they work. Isn't he responsible? Shouldn't he be called out and confronted? How should we talk to the believer, or the consumer, or the shut-eye, as we call it in the psychic wor uh, world, died in the wool loyalist? Do we simply show them our sympathy and, get, and, good, and keep quiet? Good question, I don't know, what about Yoda? What I'm saying is pick your battles and try to distinguish between victimizers and victims and try to understand how the victim got that way. And drawing again from Carol Tavers on cognitive dissonance, she says, quote, the unbending need to be right inevitably produces self-righteousness. When confidence and convictions are unleavened by humility, by an acceptance of fallibility, people can easily cross the line from healthy self-assurance to arrogance, close quote. And that's a worthwhile cautionary note for every skeptic. I'm going to leave you with one last story. Many, many years ago, a good friend of mine, a professional magician, fell victim to a con right in the heart of New York City. The con man did not prey on my friend's greed, he preyed on his kindness, his morality, his empathy, and desire to help a person who was apparently in trouble. He was a victim of an ancient psychic scam called the Pigeon Drop, and in this case a particular variant known as the Jamaican Tourist. I wish I had time to tell you the more details of it. Um, happy to talk to you about it off stage. Bottom line is my friend, my magician friend got taken for the contents of his wallet that day. But was he just another sucker, another idiot who deserves what he got? Or should we be grateful for people like him, people whose compassion for a stranger in trouble cost them their cash? We give money to the homeless because of our humanity. And if there's a risk that once in a great while we're filling the cup of someone who's only pretending to be blind but is actually watching us drop our dollar in, well, how bad is that re really? I mean, consider the alternative. So don't blame the victim. Credit the con man. Credit magical thinking. Credit cognitive dissonance and the desire to see ourselves as smart, kind, and compassionate. None of us is immune to these forces. And before you harshly judge a victim of a psychic scam 
or a pseudoscientific alternative medicine claim, remember the magician's most important lesson, everyone can be fooled. Thank you very much. Jamie Ian Swiss, ladies and gentlemen, words to live by. Words to live by.